Well, Johnny, welcome to the show. It's such a pleasure to have you here. And I'd love to start, you know, people listening, you know, will likely know you, obviously, world-class sportsman. They might remember the goal that you got, the Rugby World Cup. But I'd love to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself as you. You know, who really are you as a person? Good question. (laughs) This may take a while. Um, I don't know. What a nice answer. I don't know. I don't know much about who I am. Um, I'm revealing it and the most authentic experiences I have of me are the ones I can't talk about. But when I do, I feel like that's not it. I can't get it when I try and talk about it. I know when I start getting really interested in talking about me and who I am, I know I'm heading in the wrong direction. I spent a long time when I was younger talking about what you were talking about there, like a sporting career, lots of beliefs and values and, and this is my opinions and this is me and how I look and what I've been through in my life and all those things but what I realized after a while was these are just things that I've I've picked up it's nothing to do it was me that picked them up these things are mine they're not me and I think that's really interesting when people say you know tell me about you I'm like well what can I I can't tell you anything about me I can tell you some stuff I've been through but even what I've been through I change my mind on all the time you know look back at things now and I think that was terrible the next day I think oh that's pretty awesome look what it's done for me so to cut a long story short I haven't got a clue uh, and in that respect it makes life quite interesting because I feel like I'm finding something out and I'm learning every day I have so many questions on that that we'll we'll pick up on in a minute because I think this openness and curiosity and this internal search versus the external validation and such a universal conversation actually no matter kind of what stage in life you're at whatever your focuses are but before we get into the episode you know how are you doing today good yeah very good um i'm i'm feeling like i'm getting somewhere health-wise in terms of just you mentioned that openness i'm sort of becoming so much more open to all these things which I was a closed book on when I was younger. Everything was so physical when I was younger. If you asked me what's health health and well-being, I'd be like, well, it's looking like this and it's being able to run this far and lift this much weight and all these kind of things. And maybe there was a bit of stuff in there about um, what you ate and how you slept, but that was to do with how you looked, you know. Now, when you ask me about health and well-being, it's, it's... it's my potential how am I feeling and in a way I I tend to judge that on the fact that am I kind of fully engaged am I enjoying and grateful to be alive and in those respects yes I am I feel like you know there's then there's the best is yet to come I think and that's a good sign for, for health and well-being you know I'm excited about what's next and less interested about what's been I think that's such a refreshing attitude. And I guess just to give you some context, what I'm so interested in, I've been working in the health and well-being space for the last 10, 11 years. And I've got fascinated by the kind of ins and outs and the intricacies and the data and the science. But what I've become really interested in now is how do we actually utilize that every single day, as you said, to really unlock your potential. I think the world of wellness is so often so inherently connected to everything you're saying it's to the physical and whether that's in your case to performance or in lots of people's cases it's to weight loss or wanting to look a certain way or appear a certain way as opposed to how you kind of truly feel on the inside and what I'm so interested in is these universal searches I guess for happiness for better well-being as a total but the fact that life throws all of us challenges you know life is anything but linear and those challenges will look different for you as for me as to anybody listening but they always come and how do we use the various different facets of wellness the well-being industry to better cope with life's challenges and to see us through things to reflect better to be able to show up better every day as opposed to using them to put us in a box and the reason I was so interested um, to have you on the show and I so appreciate your time today is it sounds so much to me like that really defines your experience in lots of different ways and that you have almost lived a life of two halves from everything I've heard from what you've said you had this first half which was so much about the external and in a way looking for happiness in other people's views of you and ticking off accomplishments and by any stretch of the imagination gosh you ticked off more accomplishments than you know anyone could really imagine achieving and yet 
it didn't really seem to serve you in any way on a kind of deeper level and it's created this huge U-turn, this catalyst moment to live what sounds to me from the outside a fundamentally completely different life where you're searching for inner peace and calm as opposed to trophies and I think in a way people would be relatively surprised if they hadn't heard your story before about that because this grass is green attitude is so deeply embedded I think in the world where people would look at you and think gosh he must have everything you know I wish I was him the luckiest person in the world and and I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about that moment that catalyst where you thought okay everyone looking from the outside would think that I do have everything I've just won England the world cup you know that's as big as big can be and and yet that wasn't the case for you on a personal level it was very briefly very very briefly how brief is brief <clears throat> at its optimum maximal level pretty much a single moment it is that euphoria of immense completion and fulfillment and a sense of worth and and aliveness it is it's so brief though the reason it's so brief is because in the truth of the message this too shall pass does not just for your suffering it's for your joy as well in that respect when it's placed in that area and it did it just was it was immediately through the fingers to the extent that you have then have a breather you go from that jumping around celebration to then breathing and and looking around and sort of going wow this is amazing but that's already a different experience and then you go down to the, oh, well, what do we do now? You know, or we, we do a, a, a lap of the field. And on the lap of the field, it's a different kind of energy. And the euphoria is becoming something. It's still brilliantly pleasant. But it's waning. And a night's sleep really, really does something. The cold light of morning, you can't touch anymore you're so connected to it in that immediate moment but when you when it becomes the past you just can't touch it you can't derive that same pleasure out of it and that fleeting nature was quite was quite depressing for me because i banked on that hollywood ending you know those credits rolling and me walking into the sunset and kind of going well that's it bring on my joy and it, obviously as everyone says you know i understand the destination the journey analogy it's a big understanding but even the journey you've got to break that down to understand how do you make the most of every moment and how you don't is by trying to hold on to every moment and that was the thing you thought that that moment would last but you have to understand nothing no moment's going to last everything's going to evolve but if we keep evolving we connect we stay connected but evolving into what and this is my big thing I think for me and my whole journey has been about I th have thought I knew what my potential was. So I've gone after it. This is what I'm capable of. And it's great to have that kind of motivation, ambition and, and confidence. But to think you know what you're capable of and to think you know what someone else is capable of are just massive dead ends. And for me, that whole experience of evolution means you can't know what you're going to evolve into. That's the whole point of it. It has to be a surprise. And when you mention challenge, challenge for me has always been offering me that doorway into something unknown do you want to go there but I've been too I guess enslaved by this idea of holding on to my past because my past has given me an idea this is what felt good and so therefore what will feel amazing will be just more of that and so that's been my past dominating my future and my evolution has just been well I'll win another one which is why people struggle so much when they finish their career in sport because it's almost like, well, I can't win another one. Well, what do I do now? Well, it's like, well, hold on. The adulation, the adoration, that kind of thing. How do I get that respect and reverence? Well, I'll go and become a coach. I'll go and be on the TV or I'll go and build a business and have this much money or whatever it is. But all of that stuff, it's the same dead end, just repeating itself. The evolution into the unknown has been the beauty of that challenge for me. Every challenge I have is a question of saying, are you willing to to surrender whereas my answer has always been in those challenges on the sporting field I must conquer but there's a difference when you're playing a game and you're trying to conquer a situation but when you're looking at internal experiences those challenges you mentioned 
big emotions, um, huge fear for me being my main one, sense of um, that imposter syndrome, the the inferiority, the uh, the kind of weakness, whatever it might be, all of that stuff, uh, lack of worth, those feelings, you don't conquer them. You don't f find the answer and win over them. That just sort of keeps them alive. You need to face them and let them out because it's underneath that where the beauty is. And, and that's why I mentioned at the very beginning, who am I? I don't know. Is that therefore I trust the universe a bit more when it points me to a challenge. I say, right, thank you. What is it I'm supposed to understand from this? Not I'll take you on one on one. Because uh, when I did try and take the universe on in that respect with my challenges, I spent so much time absolutely battered mentally, emotionally, physically. And not not that long ago, maybe sort of five or six years ago, I was sat in the presence of a, a kind of realized yogi who took one look at me and just said, wow, you're physical, mental uh, energies are, sh are battered. And I sort of said, how do you know that? He said, well, I, I, I see it straight away in you. He said, you've, you've had a hard ride. You've, you've pushed it hard. And you, that's, that's where your opportunity is to heal. And this is my new kind of journey, I guess, is that you don't heal back to where you were. You heal into your potential, which is why everything's about healing. You don't win your way to your potential. You actually win your way essentially away from it. But you heal into it and you can have the best world, the, the best of both worlds. When I was at my best in my sporting days, and even now when I when I perform, if, I, if I'm coaching, if I need to perform, I'm at my best when I surrender and I become one with what I'm doing. But everything I've done in the past is to be, look at me, look how distinguished and defined and different I am, look how I stand above, and now this me is gonna do this. And as soon as you have that separation, you have pressure. Because that me looks at what it's trying to do and says, oh, it's so difficult. Therefore, I have to believe I can do it. But when you have a gift and a desire and a, and a connection with something, which is what sport was for me and is what ball skills has, has been for me for some reason, you give into that gift and you connect to it. There's no me trying to do it, so there's no pressure. What you see and what you imagine, what you feel, transcends time. So before you do something, you feel it. It's already done. As long as you stand out the way, you get out the way and you allow it to happen. And that effortlessness is the basis of, of genius. You see it on the field when you see a true genius in their field. It looks like they're taking the mic, but they're not. They're just deeply, fully engaged. They're just out their way. And <clears throat> that challenge moving into the unknown, that proactive decision to move towards humiliation in, term, in time sometimes is that going into the unknown, removing those boundaries. And what you do when you surrender, for me anyway, you don't end up nowhere. You end up finding more and more of your gift, your reason, your purpose. Life becomes more vibrant through that surrender. It certainly doesn't become more of a kind of, oh, well, I can no longer be part of the, the game now. I've got to go and sit it out and do my inner work. The inner work connects you to everything and everyone. I couldn't agree with that more and it's certainly been an, a big experience in my life to try and switch the external to the internal and I think you know whoever everyone listening whatever it is that's going on in their own lives I think we can all relate to this very common mentality of when I get a promotion I'm going to be really really happy when I marry this person I'll be really happy when I get this new boyfriend this new car I lose weight I change my hair whatever it is we're kind of we're always assuming when we achieve something or when we do something or get something that is when life will be really really easy and I think it's one of the biggest misconceptions that we have because fundamentally I don't think that's ever the case with anyone but I think what's so powerful is that everything I mentioned there I guess is on a slightly smaller scale is what you're talking about is kind of you know the 0.001% of accomplishments that people could have in their lives and yet it's still you said you still had things like imposter syndrome and I think that would it's just surprising to people and again one of the things I really want these conversations to do is just show kind of the human nature and the fact that we all have these brains that can kind of be monkey brains and feed us all these kind of really complicated emotions and we can all pin our self-worth on the external no matter how successful in a conventional use of the word successful we seem and I'm really curious before we really move on to how you did that because I'm so interested in your kind of 
toolkit for want of a better word because it's such a different way of looking at the world but clearly it sounds like it's given you an inner contentment and joy like you you didn't have before but how did you what what was it that you feel created this need for external validation and that the achievement had to be what would bring you happiness and were you surprised in some ways when you woke up the next day after achieving the goal of goals in your life and and you felt empty did that surprise you yes it did when it, when i woke up day after that world cup final or there were other big moments all around the place and sometimes it would last a bit longer but it would always drift away um and to answer your question about what it was that was driving this it's probably the same as i I don't know but maybe lots of people in that when there's a disconnection with your true self and your true worth fueled by this you know society's view or things you pick up or things you go through that leave their mark or whatever that represents itself certainly in my life as fear when you don't realize your infiniteness your eternalness you're going to be wrapped in fear about this apparent world we live in where everything's so finite so if you're lost in the finite that you're dissociated from the infinite part of you you're going to be blown around by the wind you're going to be struggling i think of it as almost like a, a tree with 10 mile roots when the wind blows it kind of goes ah this is beautiful when the tree's got no roots in there it's got you know just a couple of feet of roots it's going to be thinking i've got to hold on for dear life here and grounding ourselves in that is a is that inward place you can't just sit there and go well i believe i am right i've done it now you've got to find experience you've got to find actual empirical kind of moments where you deeper sort of sensory stuff so i had this journey when I grew up when I was dissociated from myself in some ways whatever I picked up about not being good enough here not being this not being that I had huge huge fear and that fear was making all my choices for me so I had this as I see it now as it sort of comes through me this massive massive gift and drive and purpose and meaning about expressing myself and my talent for sport and the competitive nature and a ball in my hands and being able to be creative with it but when that hit this kind of gap between or this dissociation between me and and my real worth it then kind of almost becomes fed through that that sort of prism and comes out filtered into this desire to please people to win to be successful to be respected to be known as the best and all these kind of things so even though that gift is expressing itself, is expressing itself through that kind of dissociation, it, it just made it a lot of suffering. And did you feel in lots of ways, you're almost on a hamster wheel, you know, you can't get off it, you can't win, because the the fear is, there's always something to be afraid of, you know, if you don't win the next game or, you know, get the next accolade or the next success, then, you know, you're not worthy and you take another knock to your self-esteem, but also if your self-esteem is always defined by what other people think of you, then it's almost you're always having to vie for more attention, for more validation. You can kind of never breathe. Did it feel yeah. a bit like that? Like yeah. you just couldn't stop running? Because yeah. if you stopped running, what what were you? Definitely. And, and <laughs> stopping running essentially was was being at peace, being happy to say, you know, wow, things. Are, how, how difficult is it to say, wow, things are going really well. I love this. But th- when things were going well for me, I was at my most fearful. That was when it was going to come and get Because you were fearful that it would end. That it and would then be what? taken away. And so I, I always liked to be in that position where I believed myself into a corner where I could say, right, no one likes me. No one thinks I can do this. And I love that I'll show them attitude. And the more that people praise me, the harder it got to create that story. But the thing with the fear is, is that that fear element, that insecure me, when it does well, in terms of it gets results albeit through suffering that me is almost proving itself so you're not going to get rid of it the same way that a mindset of fear when you feed it it just becomes a bigger mindset of fear an insecure me when it seems to win i'm gonna protect that because it's got the answer so i did actually think i had the formula for how to be successful at sport and i wrote a book on it just after the world cup and it's full of dogma and 
ridiculously intense statements that are just so rigid and dangerous because it's the insecure me saying I'm doing well and this is how I see life and essentially it was always leading to where it was led it had actually been into places of real crisis moments and suffering and depression and anxiety and panic attacks and what have you and it carried on into those spaces and the funny thing is as much as I love talking about these things and exploring it and experiencing it does that mean I'm finished with those things? no I have them all the time I've had I probably had plenty over the weekend <laughs> I had a big one about a couple of years ago that lasted for maybe six, seven months it's like so now you look at the two thinking well hold on would I go back to being that that player that most of my suffering was just you know oh god I lost that game and I've got to do this and ah uh, and then have those fleeting moments of it's going well but oh gosh now Sunday's gone it's played Saturday Sunday was my day of where I can enjoy it but now Monday it's all about <gasps> the fear of what's coming would I go back to that or would I have would I face the challenges as I do now I would choose only one thing I would be here now and I wish I could in a way I wish I could I, I do this in my coaching to allow players to explore that whilst they're playing so that they can have more moments of genius more moments of realizing that I probably had a handful of great moments and out of a 18 year career and would you say at this point listening to you talking about panic attacks and feeling depressed would you say you also had quite low self-esteem at this point which i think would feel quite surprising again to people when you're doing so well that you could see yourself in a light that was so different to how they saw you i think there are certain areas where i had low i just had a, a different view of my worth so you could put me on a rugby field put a ball on my hand and I could just go bang I'm I'm here I'm everything I need to be and people would have this you know like certain sports people would just say when I'm on the field I'm just at home I would have that but for so many other moments I would be there thinking oh my god and I'd be putting on a, a facade and an image as I did most mostly in the rugby as well just because you you just don't trust yourself you don't value yourself it's difficult because when you're in that space of vulnerability in the first sort of terms times you're coming to terms with it a lot of the conditioning comes in and life can be quite harsh in that way people speak about the way that you know that boys speak to each other men speak to what people put as important how people put people down in these respects and it can really gather and accumulate and it can be difficult um, but there is an absolute truth to the my in my experience i don't know if there's many but there's an absolute truth that the the deeper you go down the more you realize that everything just comes clear and that there isn't this separation there isn't this kind of some are more worthy than others it's just not the case but when we live in that surface area which is very very physical as you mentioned how we look yeah you know, how much we earn what we've amassed what wealth we've got what we house we live in what job we do all these kind of things by nature that is a very um, you know separate and I guess difficult space to try and find worth because it's all relative and like you mentioned about pleasing people I know that I can bounce up and down so you know you you could we could have a great chat and we could all be yeah tomorrow I could be going through something you say hi and I walk past you suddenly it's like oh gosh what's happened you know what have I done wrong people have are flippant people are all over the place just like me <laughs> yeah so if you're going to base your worth on anything don't give it to other people and also don't give it to events in the world because they also unfold unpredictably give it to something you really know and if you want to find out what you really know you've got to go deep yeah you can really only define it yourself and I, I couldn't agree with that more and I hope you don't mind me saying this but I think you know it's I've, it's really brave to make such a big change to make it so publicly you know you said there that you wrote a book after the world cup when you know you must be one of the most famous people in the country and to then say now you know i really fundamentally disagree with what i wrote there and i think that was dangerous advice in lots of ways that's a very honest and brave thing to say and i'm i'm sure getting to that point 
to be able to say that so openly and so calmly despite nervousness you know I'm sure initially that people would come at you for it that's not an easy thing to do and you know changing your life around isn't an easy thing to do and again that's that's the conversation that I'm so interested in having because I think so many of us have these moments whether they're big or they're small where we feel stuck in our lives and we have this moment where we realize we don't want to be where we are anymore whether that's with our physical health our mental health whatever facet it is but making the changes can feel almost impossible. And I really want to talk about how you made those changes and how you went from this such a different mindset and such a different set of beliefs and what was important to where you are today. But I was curious before we get to kind of how you got from one to the other, was there a moment where you thought, okay, I can't live like this anymore? You know, I imagine it kind of built up and built up, but was there, do you remember a sense or where you were or what you felt when you recognized that, this emptiness, this kind of lack of self-trust, self-belief, it was getting you down to such a point that something just had to change? So I, I had most of my reactivity was very fear-based. So if something happened, I would almost have that <gasps> massive, and then that immediate, I can't, I can't do this, I can't deal with it, I don't know you know, what to do, everything's gone. It would be that kind of very, very... Did it feel anxious? Yeah, hugely. So very internal, though. I, you know, from people on the outside would might say, "Oh, I didn't realize because I'd be walking around, but almost like I couldn't feel my feet on the floor." Mm. Whether it be, you know, when I was young, I might have made a mistake in a rugby game that I f- thought was humiliating. I would. I, I remember there was one that I, for about sort of, I mean, for months, months, my mum and dad would be, you know, kind of sat somewhere in the house, and I'd just be sat somewhere else in the house, just doing whatever I was doing. And then all of a sudden, bang, that thought would come. Out, I'd remember it. Oh my God. and I would just be in floods of tears unbearable I'd go and do a, a kicking session down at the park I once kicked for just short of six hours non-stop as an 18 year old 17 year old rode my bike down to the park was there for six hours just lost in this idea I could not get something right and the fear was driving me to say if you don't get this right you have to stay my mum turned up in the car and went, we've been worried sick wherever you you know we didn't know what are you up to and I said I can't get it right and said look you've got to come home I went home and just spent the entire afternoon just in hysterical sort of crying or whatever. I went back again in the evening. Did you find there was this strange disconnect where people from the outside are saying, they're celebrating you, they're saying, wow, Johnny, what discipline, what focus. If only we could all have so much focus in our lives, then we could be as successful. I'm being a bit kind of reductive in the way I'm describing it. And then you're there and it sounds to me, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but it sounds like kind of, you know verging on compulsive and obsessive and it kind of destroying you to some extent it's controlling you and yet from the outside we're celebrating that but there's 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 a very interesting dynamic going on one is that it's a gift that there are times when i kick a ball and i'm home i am you can't touch me i'm just i'm at one for that brief moment but there's also, so there's a massive energy and a gift that's telling me to be there. But there's this also this other part which is saying, I need it to be this way. I don't have that trust. There's a gift saying, this is you, go express it, which has got nothing to do with what I get. It's not, I'm doing this so I get this. The doing of it is the, is the beauty. And it's, that's essentially the engagement of living in the moment. But then there's this other part which is all about what I get. And when that part was strongest I'd be on my way to to go and kick a ball or whatever I wouldn't even know why I'm going I wouldn't be able to say oh I don't want to go but I'm going because I wouldn't even had that much awareness to know what I wanted I was just going and I get there and I just go it's automatic it's robotic put the balls down off we go get really annoyed when a ball doesn't go right start to panic when two or three don't go right feel a bit of survival kind of oh, relief when they start to go where they want to go. Very rarely did I ever feel like excitement about, oh, well, yeah, I'm really excited about tomorrow now. It was just, okay, I'm ready for tomorrow now. It's life or death in that way. But in terms of that kind of, you, you mentioned before about those moments where that was where you feel like you can't go on anymore. For me, it was massively in that fear. And when that fear locked on, 
because I allowed it to lock on. They didn't know any better when I engaged with it, when I indulged it, rather than being able to have those tools you mentioned. That fear then wound and wound and then built up to a crescendo, at which point it then tips over into the depressive element. So that anxiety and anxiety and anxiety is playing in it. And it's then it becomes a lot of anxiety but also the beginnings of depression and it's still anxiety and then more depression and it's less anxiety and it's more and then it just sits in that kind of what's the point and was it you that identified that you'd sunk into that place or just did you need someone else to say to you yeah i think this is where you're at we need to I change knew, something i knew that i was down because it was so not me mm. you know walking out of training sessions not turning up to things in the, in the club you know crazy moments where the club might be going off the the team might be going off to do a signing session at a local business who, who sponsors a club and and they're kind of like oh where's you know where's johnny and if they knew it would have been mad you know the fact they didn't know that i was sat on the back training pitch up against a fence in the pouring rain in my smartest gear just on mm-hmm. a muddy field just bawling my eyes out they're just like okay that's not quite right you know and i knew that was not quite right but it's difficult because the tools I had at the time were just conquer, 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 conquer. Mm. So I've got this thing and everything is telling me you, something's not right. You need to work it out and you need to get over it. You need to, you need to beat this emotion and finding answers is what I did. I had a massive archetypal kind of foundation in being a savior and being a fixer in that respect and being in, in some ways also preferring to play the martyr as well you know finding a lot more worth in that kind of i've given it all and i'm suffering so you don't have to that kind of idea so that's what i brought to it that's what all i had i mean it's just hugely indulging it that's the fear saying the fear's driving that the fear's not going oh god don't come at me with that the fear's going no i'm i'm actually part of that i'm the reason you think like that and now you're using me to try and get rid of me it's not going to work and i knew i was down but the there was a point just in my late twenties where something clicked for some reason, and I, I just realised that yeah, this I have to change, and otherwise, this is it. And that's what kind of the depression is: is that sense of like this thing that you've built, this thing that you, you've had that, that even though you that you've disconnected from your worth, this thing has found its place. And even though it's painful at times and the inner voice is criticizing you to mad and it won't let you go and everything, it's still what you built and it can no longer be. And giving that up, the way that it's often done is, well, we'll turn it into this. But that never worked for me. The answer was, like I said, not to go from one known, oh, well, hold on, this car, you know, is kind of not really working for you. But what about this one? You're kind of like, but who am I without that shiny exterior who am I just now and that's been the journey because I thought well if I if I don't have that next car how am I going to take how am I going to perform but actually your performance is in you it doesn't take that long to learn physical skills people sort of say the 10,000 hours thing I I question that hugely because that's 10,000 hours often through doubt imagine what it's done through pure worth it's not 10,000 hours it's it's immediate intelligence applying itself so I I did have that those it often would be the case immediate anxiety peaks and then indulgement of it indulgence of it sorry and then winding it up and then over into depression and then deep it would come to that space of being like I've got to give this up and there would be Mm -hmm. a huge amount of sadness in those moments I think it's always such an interesting question that who am I without all the labels that I've put on myself or other people put themselves and I I um had a real low point with my physical health and therefore my mental health it was 2011 and you know my dad said to me for a long time you need help you depress and I I just wasn't able to recognize it I was so ill physically that I think I couldn't really cope with someone telling me there was almost one more thing wrong with me and I put off making any changes for so long I just I just I just couldn't really accept it even though I knew I, I knew really how bad it was I knew how much I didn't care for anything anymore and I'm really interested what the what the first thing you did was when you when you said okay it's not enough I imagine it's taken you 
you know, time and process and various different tools, I'm sure some of which work really well and some of which maybe didn't resonate as much to get to this outlook that you had today. I presume it wasn't an overnight change. Mm. I think the most powerful thing you can have, I think, in terms of that mindset change is is you being your own best support and your own best friend within yourself. Seeing people talk about that mind that's kind of always on at me and always telling me this and bringing me down and blaming me for this or whatever, or blaming others or whatever it might be. But when you have that best friend inside you, and when I say best friend, it's, it's not a friend that kind of just says yes to everything. It's a friend that's urging you into the unknown to be uncomfortable. But when you're no friend in there at all, when the pure you, but on its way, it's almost like you have that difficult friend and then you, or difficult colleague. And then you have this amazing friend, which just almost like arm around you and then eventually just kind of lets you go when you're no longer needed, you know. Um, and what helps you cultivate that, as well, you said, because it's moving from so many of us have that inner critic, you know, I think everyone talks about that fairly frequently that you have someone who's always planting that negativity, that self-doubt, that you're not quite good enough. You know, this person didn't reply to you because they actually hate you. Yeah. You know, there's always those little niggles. Yeah. But obviously you had that on a kind of more extreme end. Was there anything in particular that you did to help shift that voice along the continuum? I think at the beginning when you have a lot of critics in there you really need friends around you if you can't find the friend within you those friends around you do an amazing thing but often you know you end up finding yourself like i said that that insecure part of you chooses your friends for you so you end up kind of in the corner all talking about the same stuff and Mm. having the same opinion about why someone else is this or shouldn't be this or is useless or whatever um but surrounding yourself with people and, and in that moment of challenge when you find people that aren't trying to tell you what you should be doing but are actually just saying right I'm here with you so to use the analogy of a, a rugby game when you're in the change room before you're about to go out in the field there's a lot of anxiety a lot of kind of stress and everyone's looking to each other for the answer you know say the magic word to me that's going to make me go you know what yeah we can do this give me that emotional speech but whatever the speech is it only points that we're going to be okay but it can only do so much with words but when you get in a huddle just before you go out everyone puts their arms on each other and you look at each other and the the kind of hidden message is like we said at the very start of this conversation we haven't got any guarantees we don't know how this is going to go but that's the whole point of living why would you want to be here if you knew the thing is it's going to be there'll be tough moments there'll be awesome moments and it's going to be uncomfortable for us all but I'll go with you so did you change a lot of the people around you then at this point I no because I was I was probably powerful enough with my status to be leading that. Okay. So I think I was kind of, the people were great around me. There weren't many at all, but there were, but I was influencing a lot of the conversation. People were sort of saying, okay, well, we better do this. You know, I was so intense and I had such a story behind me for other people saying, oh, look at, like you mentioned, the dedication and this. So you've got to be like him. Uh, Yeah. When people say that to me now, I'm like, no, no, don't say that. Yeah. Jeez, don't do that to anyone. That's awful. Um, But, I think starting with those friends around you, the first person I came up to really was, was kind of obviously family, hugely important. But then I, I spoke to the club doctor who just had that mindset, was just so unjudgmental, so non judgmental, and just sort of said, you know, th- we just need to get you some help. And it felt a bit like, like you said, when you, you know, your, your father said, you've got to get some help. It just feels like, okay, it's the start of a journey. And it's not about, you know that somehow you're doing worse than someone else because they're not going through it. So, you know that whole kind of coping idea that you can't cope and you can, so you're better at this. It's completely irrelevant. It's but also, you're such an example of that. Really, you know, I hope you don't mind me saying it. People would have said, "Oh, he's coping yeah. great," but you weren't coping, no. and it's such a it's the ultimate example of the fact we never know what's going on behind closed doors. No, exactly. Yeah, and that's a big one. You can always do that when you always sort of liken it to when you meet a couple, and you're kind of you spend about five minutes with them. You walk away, you go, "Geez, what a lovely couple." And you just think that they're just like the perfect thing. And then you hear, oh, they've split up. You're like, all oh, right, okay. It's never as you think. Um, but the, the, yeah, I, I guess in a way, for me, that change of that inner teammate was a constantly unfolding understanding with everything I went through and everywhere I was pointed 
to go and where I felt my passion and excitement I went there and I went full on into it the understanding just comes that when you act through that insecure side and you're gathering you're gathering you're trying to gather this you're trying to survive you're trying to get through you're trying to win and conquer now you've had moments where you've won you've had moments where you've not won and you look at what happened from those and it gives you your big term picture you sort of go okay well you can pretty much extrapolate from that what the whole life's going to look like you know okay well I won the World Cup and it, and it felt like this okay well then we need to win another one right well do you realise that it might just feel like that well at the end of my career if we win both these tournaments for this team yeah yeah but it will feel and at the end of my life I have a boat in a port it will you, you see so you, you ask yourself to what end because I have enough understanding now to what end am I doing this and that's enough now to for me when I face a challenge to say well if I get through this unchanged without having to adapt and be flexible and move and expand and and somehow grow it'd be a travesty and so when you mentioned looking back at the younger version of you I, I'm able to speak about the books I wrote or the things I said because I don't have any judgment upon that me that me was doing his absolute best he's giving you can't actually do any less than your best you do what you do according to who you are and how you see the world how you feel and think about it so I look at that me and just go good for you now when I make a comment that I'm different it's not me saying that I've grown or changed it's no no that was you and this is me we don't have to be linked and I think that's the thing everyone's sort of thinking well oh because I did this I used this an analogy before or this metaphor when you you play a game on the Saturday and on the Monday they have the team review and there's something you've done on the Saturday maybe you've thrown a bad pass or someone's intercepted your pass and scored or you've kicked and missed or missed a tackle or something big and you sit there and you can see everyone in the video sat there thinking oh my god he's going to show what I did wrong and when it comes up on the screen the person sat on the Monday is feeling a humiliation because they are still the person on the Saturday you're unable to have that any objective growth from it because you're still tied emotionally to what that felt like and then I look at what I went through as a child and I'm still tied emotionally to what I went through as a child I might live this entire life as a child I won't change. I'm not saying that being a child is phenomenal. I look at my child, I'm like, geez, you're the most beautiful example of, of human life I could imagine. But living your whole life through those child life, or, or what I was given, or, 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 or what hit me as a child to say that that's going to answer all my questions for me for the rest of my life, I think that's a travesty. I'd like to think that I'll look back on this interview and, you know, if we met again in two years, and we'd be like, yeah, we're both very different why well because we've lived and we've evolved I think there used to be a stiff upper lip sort of worth or, or, or credibility in being able to say I've always done this you're like but has are you happy <laughs> now because of it no and that's what I live my career doing I always kick for this moment's time and I always do this right how happy are you not at all yeah right. it's such an important question isn't it and i think we're we're often not compassionate enough to ourselves but to each other in in kind of saying this is who you've always been so this is who you should stay because that's yeah. how i know you and and breaking free if that's really difficult and um, i'm curious again just to dig into these tools so you kind of i guess we're going down the for once for better word we call it the conventional route through the doctor who you know yeah. is saying you know look i think you need some help I'm curious about what that looked like but then it sounds like alongside that you did quite a lot of work in terms of the more spiritual side and Buddhism but then also nutrition and breathing and mindfulness and um, one thing I wanted to pick up on I guess which wraps it all up quite nicely it's I have heard you say that in your kind of peak you were you were really fit but you weren't healthy because healthy incorporates this much more kind of 360 approach of the full mind and body you know our stress management our sleep and everything not just for performance sake so I'm really interested in what that all looked like but also sounds like it's a very very different view of health today than it was then when you're probably at peak fitness you probably can't really be fitter as a human but yet that's not leading to health which I think 
guess I'm keen just to point out as well, we're recording this in, in January and it's the time where everyone's like, health equals getting shredded, yeah. equals having mm-hmm. a six pack, equals looking a certain way or dropping seven dress sizes in the next four days. You know, it's this, you, someone looks a certain way so they must be fit. Yeah, definitely. So that initial stage, I guess the thing I found out most quickly is that when you work with someone, whether it's yeah, just the same as friends, when you're struggling, you need to m- match that energy. So you need to you need to find someone that matches your energy, and maybe that sometimes involves someone that can connect with your likes and dislikes and your passions and your gifts as well, so that they can understand how to work with you. And so for a while, I was bouncing around people that were, you know, just I'm sure would work brilliantly for others because of that match. But for me, there wasn't a match there. I found someone who had a bit more of a match and we were able to communicate on levels where we could sort of like, and and also what helped was that someone coming from that space was an OCD sufferer. So obviously a lot of my stuff obsessive came out of that real insecurity, that fear, that survival nature meant that I was never switched off. So I could run thoughts and thoughts and thoughts. So I would have that as well. But being able to communicate with someone who matched that energy rather than sort of with a clipboard there saying, well, right well tell me this you've got someone saying did it feel a bit like this because I had this and so you always had this feeling that no one's ever got it as bad as I did but then you meet someone who's really challenging that idea but then also when you have someone that can match your intensity around your sport so f- you know for me I tend to find I have a a bit of an in when I speak to sports people who are struggling because I'm kind of sort of saying well I can we can go there so that that kind of helped but those kind of discussions were a really massive part of the first part the next part is that you've got to do it sort of on your own i think um when i say on your own doesn't mean you 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 separate yourself from other people at all but there's part of it where you have to apply that essentially acceptance so in terms of the tools there's kind of three and they're always on it's not like you do this, you do this, you do this. They're always on. One of them is is awareness. You've got to be aware of how you're feeling, because if you what what you're not aware of, you can't do anything with. It remains unconscious. There's all different kinds of techniques of bringing up things that you're not aware of into your awareness space, so they become conscious. The second part, that again is always on, is, is acceptance. And this is where I had a big issue. I was kind of aware of a lot of these. Well, I wasn't actually because I wasn't aware of these thoughts. I didn't accept I resisted I just I like I said I kind of indulged them I answered them I tried to get rid of them I tried to do all these kind of things to these thoughts and feelings which just kept them alive because it validated the fear as I reacted with urgency to them it was almost like there was a scoring system saying well you know if people come sprinting out of a building you're kind of like there must be something in there the same way that if I'm running around doing this it must be something real so you validate it and it just stays but the capacity to accept, and that f- is in so many different forms, whether it's just sitting, breathing, meditation, whether it's that kind of feeling, welcoming feelings, just being slow walking can be all these kind of ways, feeling your feet in the ground, becoming more sensitive in your body, whatever, it's just slowing down, anything you can do, sleep, a huge part of acceptance, um, getting your sleep and all those kind of things but m- just massive relaxation when your whole body is saying go in order to challenge that you need to do the opposite which is to say stay stay relax and when it says get rid you say welcome <laughs> when it says hate you say love and you, but it, it can't be a trick if it's conditional it's not acceptance if you have a if I'm doing acceptance so I can get this it's not it's conditional so therefore you can't say, well, I'm going to do my acceptance work so I get rid of this feeling. We're still trying to get rid of the feeling. I'm going to do my acceptance work so I can become one with this feeling. And if it may stay for the rest of my life, then it will stay. So you just fully accept yourself, whoever you are at any point in your life. You accept this moment for what it is and these feelings for, for what they are. What you don't accept is what they're telling you about things. You don't accept this person's just called me an idiot, so I accept I'm an idiot. You just accept that, okay, I have this feeling. I have this, this person has said this, I have this feeling, it's like, okay, let me breathe in this feeling. Let me own it by realizing that I don't have to run. You know, there are moments where things happen and you know you've got to run, you run. You know, like I said, that building's happening and it's on fire. You don't just stand there and breathe into it. You go, you know the difference. 
and the third tool I think is is part of that awareness still but it's becoming more aware of your passions and excitements your impulses your insights that drive you towards this is interesting to me I want to go and explore this what's my gift because that will reveal I think the meaning and your 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 purpose whereas often our purposes are a lot I need to do this because I was brought up this way and because this is the good and right thing to do but underneath that there's there's a reason why we find ourselves where we do you know why am I doing this? It was the same gift behind the rugby that wanted to connect with people. I know, I know I feel like I want to connect with people. I want to speak on a deeper level. I don't want to talk about surface material stuff about this, this, this. I want to connect with people. The rugby was part of that, but because of my belief system at the time, it came out as a massive suffering journey, but still I connected with people. People come up to me and say, you know, you playing on the field, I really felt that added this to my life. So it was getting there, but through suffering through effort and I find now I'm in a much more effortless space because I do sort of spend time just sort of being a lot more sensitive to those subtle things of like I want to do this I feel more like this at the moment and just seeing how far I can explore that within which is what you know you might call exploring your highest excitement in any moment obviously if you're at work and you say I really fancy you know going out for a walk and you're like yeah but you're doing a presentation right now you're like well I can't do it now but then okay well what can I do right now what's my highest excitement right now and it might be as it is for me breathing I mean breathing we we can last without eating for weeks drinking for days breathing for a couple of minutes when we're talking we're breathing when we're eating we're breathing when we're performing we're breathing breathing is as close to the first step as we can get alongside heart beating and yet no one goes near it everyone wants to do the what should I say how should I perform what can I train but underneath all that is your breathing now you ask anyone that does any kind of yoga or anything where they try to do something challenging your breathing will determine how your balance and when you look at someone who's not performing look at the breathing and why wouldn't you spend all your time becoming more aware of something you're not aware of my breathing and um as soon as you do that even with me just looking into breathing so many things come up you think oh my gosh I realize that I realize I've been holding my stomach in for about 35 years I have been I look back and think why did I do that oh, I see some times at school when there was some shaming going on about people and I was kind of like oh my gosh well my stomach pokes out a bit now I've held my stomach in for nearly 40 years and you kind of go so what's my breathing be like well, there's a thing called your belly breath. I wouldn't even gone near it. So suddenly I'm kind of like, whoa, what an opportunity. I performed an entire career without even knowing how to breathe. Now, how exciting could that be? Now, what about if you could bring out your heartbeat? What if you could start to operate on a much more conscious level with the way your body moves, with your circulation, with your feelings, with everything? That's where the opportunity is, and it's there right now. It doesn't matter whether you're sat on a train, whether you're sat in a car and stuck in traffic, whether someone's having a go at you, you have the opportunity to say, oh, what about my breathing? What about my posture, the way I stand, the way I align, the way I connect? You have this every moment. And yet, because I can't be in the gym, I'm like, oh, God, this is a waste of time. Oh, completely. I think that it's a lot of the challenge for me within the wellness industry with being well, with feeling great in yourself is this association of the perfect enemy of good. You know, if you can't be in the gym or you can't be in a meditation class, you can't help yourself as you said you can always focus on the simple things like breathing grounding how you're sitting and you know it seems to me from from where I'm sitting and and the way you're talking that you're really filled now with a huge amount of self-compassion and self-acceptance which I think is it's a goal for for so many people really because I I I really agree with you that I think that's the unlocker of of contentment not of happiness because I don't think happiness and contentment are necessarily the same thing but the sense of true calm and and enjoyment from life and I really don't mean this to say flip and I can't think of almost a better word but I know for me this whole for once for better word journey it's been 11 years now and and when I started I was at rock bottom with my physical health with my mental health and actually with my self-esteem my self-worth and I didn't know that really at the time but as I've gone through the last decade I've really realized that and that's been the thing that I've worked on the most and I certainly feel 
like an unrecognizable person to who I felt I was before but I would say it's been a really difficult journey to get from one to the other and one that sometimes you really don't feel like doing and it's much easier to stay in the past and as I said I don't want to sound overly simple but I, I guess it's reassuring to know you know did you find it hard going from where you were to where you are now because the way you speak makes it sound so natural it's clearly very much seems that it's inherently who you are today but was that a difficult journey and were there moments where you thought oh it's too hard I can't do it I can't break myself into a million pieces to put myself back together yeah definitely there uh, there is nothing harder there is no harder journey and that's the courage of it that it takes um if it was easy everyone would be doing it but if you look how easy in retrospect the other journey is that's why everyone's doing it no matter how much and how stressful it is to compulsively react takes no intervention at all it just happens automatically but to move against your habitual conditioning it takes those things awareness it takes acceptance and then it takes a deeper kind of listening to yourself and that's taxing it's not taxing it's more taxing definitely at the beginning it's not taxing now i have an excitement and passion for it but it's it's taxing because there's this momentum behind what you've always done and how it's always been and how it should be there's a momentum and the danger is is that people think that this journey is yeah that that ball that's rolled that rock that's rolling down the hill with that momentum is that you say right okay i'm going to just stand in front of it and stop it and push it the other way you'll get flattened that's what people do they, they go for a day and they're like oh no and then it's gone it that's the part of acceptance is that actually what you do is you run alongside the rock and you're kind of like looking at it and then gradually you just kind of steer it a bit and you steer it and you steer it and then it goes to flat ground and now you can start using that same energy to push it in a different direction all the time it's much more effortless but at the beginning it feels like you want to just get in there and go oh i'm doing badly it's a classic example of standing in front of it you're kind of saying well i need to be more compassionate i haven't been compassionate myself i'm doing badly it's like well you're now being even less compassionate it's the obvious it's almost like that reinforcement without being able to see it but the ultimate space i think is having some silence and some solitude in your life having especially just before bed i find really works well for me to sit there and say okay before i go to sleep i will have at least 10 minutes i will sit here and i'll you know what the great things to, for me i look at whether i just become very aware of the sensations around my body and just use that to as my focus and then just try and tune into them um for that 10 minutes or you might repeat a mantra in your mind or focus on your breathing but the thing is, is straight away that other part of you is going well this isn't working is it what am I doing? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not. I haven't got a halo above my head yet. I haven't. I'm not shining an aura. My world isn't changed. But the thing is, is that just do it. How the long same. have you been doing it now? From where you started this journey? Well, initially I didn't. Initially I sidestepped it. Initially I, I spiritually sidestepped my issues because when I was speaking to uh, someone, they pushed. They sort of like meant just happened to mention the Buddha. And I really connected because I was kind of like, here's a guy that's gone out there and taken it on. But it's just enough catching on to my saviour archetype, my warrior archetype, my martyr archetype. And I'm sort of like, that part of me is sort of gone, I could do this and still stay rather than have to go. So let me go and take on that spiritual journey like everyone else. So I'll read all the books and I'll understand all the knowledge. But I was still doing it out of some way that I'm like because I'll get something out of this so I was almost I was kind of understanding a huge amount but I wasn't applying it if you said to me do you want to meditate I'd be like no I want to read books I want knowledge I want to be able to tell people what I've read I want to be able to stand there and be like yeah I'm into that because you know that's the the new thing and it, it did relieve that stress because my mind was on something else but the the real power is in applying and so for that part you know probably for the last difficult to say I had such an amazing period between about 2015 to about 2019 where if you, someone asks you how you are you can't help it you're like 
I feel amazing. Everything's unfolding for me. I found that connection. And then I got hit hard again in about 2020 for about a year, a uh, bit less maybe. And since then... With challenges with your mental with health? With a big one. Yeah, I mean, I get them all the time. But and when I say it's a big one, often it's difficult to know because actually a big one starts the same way as a small one for mm. me now. It starts the same way, but when you're not ready and you go there, you indulge it and, th- and then you push the ball down the hill. When it's rolling fast, you'll say, I feel terrible, I can't deal with this. But all it takes, instead of pushing it down the hill, you just gently stop it when it's, yeah, you, you slow it down when it starts. At that time, I let one get going and then I really indulged it and I just, it showed me that I had sidestepped a lot. I had a huge, huge amount of learning to do and I still have loads. I can feel it. I mean, I have so much to go, but I can't help the fact that whereas my life used to be survive, 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 I feel my life now is a lot more revelation 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 growth like expansion worlds looking different daily whereas at the time i can point out easily for 18 years the world looked exactly the same um whereas now you know that's that effort i find myself more effortlessly engaging and maybe who knows you never know whether any of these ones i've had recently could have become big ones but you're able to sit there and go stay with it you know just trust in in yourself and what have you and that's like I said, with those kind of tools, there is no there is no better option than just going to quiet and just observing, lovingly observing what's going on and knowing that, as we said before, this shall pass and then get your evidence from that. When you feel yourself feeling better, make sure you mark that in your mind and say, look, I was feeling like that and now I'm feeling like this. It's only taken this long. It did pass. It always has passed. And then make sure that's kind of an understanding that goes alongside the reactive one that says, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. There's the other one that says, this is always past. But I also think it's an important point as well, which is that it's not linear. <laughs> you know, yeah. it sounds like you've gone, you know, very much on a, for want of a better word, upward trajectory from, you know, early 2000s, 20 years later to where you are now, but it's not without dips and you know ups and downs and rounds and rounds along the way and I think sometimes again we look at wellness and this industry and all these various different tools as okay well I'm going to start meditating or I'm going to start eating well we're going to start exercising or yoga or spiritual practices and then everything's going to be fixed and I'm never going to struggle again and then we're almost disappointed and frustrated when we do and I think it's such an important point which again is the point is never it's not that you'll never feel stress again or never feel anxiety or never feel depression or flare-ups of different physical health conditions. It's just that it helps us create a toolkit for for the bad times and, and a belief system that perhaps there's a way through it or maybe we won't go quite as low as last time. I remember when I was getting better specifically on like a physical basis but elements of my mental health my mum would and I'd be so disheartened because I was working so hard to get better and I felt I was doing all the right things every day and then I'd be bed bound again for a week or two weeks and and I would you know I just give myself a real berating for it you know and I remember my mum always saying you know measure the fact that today's bad day is actually a much better bad Hmm, day than you would have had three five six months ago um you know and just remember that and I, I always thought yeah, we're always held on to that. But I'm really curious, you know, as we kind of start to head towards the end of this, are there any daily non-negotiables you have, kind of facets of looking after yourself, whether that's through your diet, through your mindset that you do daily or daily-ish to keep looking after yourself? So <laughs> I, w- I want to just pick on what you just said because it's really, really interesting, just on the one before as well. Um, my brother works as a, uh, in the physical health space very much. So we work together on a lot of things. He comes at it from a very physical perspective, but then moves into mental through that doorway. And he's always telling me about the stress adaptation, this positive stress adaptation. So in the gym, you know, you, you kind of go and train, but the training breaks you down. It kind of actually harms you a little bit. And he says that it's actually, people get bigger, if that's your goal, in the kitchen, in the bedroom when you eat and when you sleep, when you respond, and through that supporting of the body, you actually end up with a positive stress adaptation. Now, if you don't do those things, you end up with a negative stress adaptation. You just add stress on top of stress and you break yourself down. That's what I did during my career with just constant uh, stressing rather than any healing. So that's what I meant before about saying you heal beyond where you were before. 
and it's very much the same as in life for me anyway is that if you want to grow if you have any desire to explore and I think we all do who we really are what we're really capable of how this world can really look how we can connect with each other but you don't want challenge well then it ain't gonna happen and that challenge in a way breaks us down <clears throat> it does harm us it's hurtful that's why it's you it's why everyone reacts you do react but the question therefore I guess is how long are you going to react for before you start getting in the kitchen in the bedroom metaphorically speaking and that before you start relaxing and breathing and soothing and looking after your body and taking that walk and following your passions speaking to people you love how long are you going to stay in that cycle for and that kind of positive stress adaptation is why every time I have challenge I'm grateful I hate it but I'm so grateful because I know I'm asking for this I'm asking to find out I want to see I want to feel what life really is and this is part of the path the fact that yeah, I'm, I could, if I was younger I'd say oh well the universe just won't let me feel it look it keeps telling me I can't have this and that it's making me feel like this but actually now I'm like no it's asking me to go and feel it I've got to do my job which is to get out the way and allow um, and in terms of the, the daily stuff which is all part of that meeting those challenges those challenges can be small when you know you feel like oh, I can't be bothered do it if you can if, it's, if there's enough in there um, breathing, as I mentioned, is huge. I do something on the breathing every evening. Um, massive focus on breathing, whether that's techniques in with regard to uh, deeper kind of guided breathing things or whether it's just focusing on breathing throughout the day whenever I can. Even when I'm training, I focus on nasal breathing massively. Nasal breathing all the time, especially sort of belly-wise, to see when I can be doing that. Even in situations, I mentioned I was sprinting here to get to the interview. <laughs> whilst I'm spinning here I'm going and every now and again I'm like oh, panting I'm so sort of, stop panting you know like come on this is this is the challenge this is today's this morning's challenge meditation every day and um, in some way I think to become aware of a space where I've been challenged every day to be aware of my challenge when I'm in the challenge so you know when I'm when I have a bit of a a, f a feeling towards someone I stop and go right brilliant noticed it rather than get to the end of the day and look back and go oh, I've had a bit of a stressful day I want to notice it when it's happening because even just noticing it, it goes it's incredible when you notice it you can't avoid the fact that oh I've seen it and it looks so ridiculous compared to at the end of the day when it looks so valid um, and similarly the, the the last thing would be in the same way as being aware of things that uh, I uh, my real time stress I'd be aware of my real time gratitude as well as I'm in the middle of a day just to be like oh my god how lucky am I and how great is life and in that respect I really like to do that about other people and every time I meet someone I'll just be like how fascinating are you you know whatever your apparent story is on the surface I'll be like how fascinating are you and those things look after every day and if you have time for it my brother and I's kind of cool thing is see the opportunity to be in life's gym every day and what that means is flow through the day I'm giving the most tools in one day here <laughs> it's a really ridiculous amount of tools but it's kind of how my mind works in exploring this but if I have to run here as I did to get here for the interview um, how do I want to run am I running as I want to run am I running smoothly am I puffing and panting or am I actually enjoying this run when I get in the car how do I easy do I get in the car? And you know, when I stand, how how straight and easy do I make that? How much do I flow with grace through my day? And if I have to pick up shopping, yeah, I carry it. Realize that you know, when people carry shopping in their house, they kind of go, ah, oh, just didn't have time to go to the gym today. So you just carried a heavy weight, fifty meters. You're in the gym all the time. You have this opportunity to move beautifully, to flow with your life. Uh, and focusing on breathing as I mentioned that quietness and that gratitude it kind of brings that all about anyway but sooner or later that kind of conscious experience of every moment starts unlocking things because in order to do that you've got to release a lot of things that were standing in the way and once when they kind of release a bit they kind of leave a bit of an understanding with you as they go um, and they're always 
things you you didn't have it for you know you always think well I, I know what that meant and when it comes out it'll be like wow I, yeah I, I never looked at it that way I love this idea of consistently checking in with yourself as you said you meet someone it could be literally just a passing getting a coffee from a coffee shop but it's just that sense of wow I'm really lucky to have this coffee even when the day's so hectic you can still have these little punctuations throughout it and I think the more certainly I've seen that in my life the more you're able to stop and notice that the quicker the mindset shift is because you you really do retrain your brain to seek that out and yeah that it it makes life feel a lot lighter and a lot smoother as you said and am I right in saying that you've got quite a big focus as well on nutrition in terms of that everyday outlook and feeling yeah so I mean so much so that out of this journey and exploration came a desire when I at the end of my rugby career to kind of do something in the nutrition space because I was sort of starting to really desire as you can imagine through it was kind of my late 20s that I really hit a really deep deep hole um, or fell into a deep hole early 20s <clears throat> sort of mid-teens you know just before I was about 10 and then when I was younger I'd had these sort of moments but the late 20s one was a big one and so I was working my way processing a lot of that stuff and when I was about 32 so you know maybe a good three or four or five years later I got to the stage where I was starting to look at diet and realizing geez what do I eat how do I eat looking around the change room thinking we're performers and I get it that there's this very laboratory designed diet <clears throat> everything packaged away but it's so processed because it gets that way and uh, with each step of processing we're almost saying okay here's where we take it from we have to take it process one <laughs> then we take it away and store it so it's no longer immediately fresh process two and then we do this to it three four and by the time it reaches us it's not connected you know, to when you're walking along and you sort of pick a blackberry and you just go, there it, there it is. So trying to get to that that kind of ground in nature, I realized just how dissociated we were in this fit but not healthy journey. You were mentioning all these fit, muscular people around me eating this stuff, but you could tell in so many ways, not to get too graphic, that they weren't healthy, neither was I. Um, and so I wanted to find something that, that kind of connected in that way and something that really meant something to me on that mental emotional health journey as I started to explore deeper and deeper came to the understanding of the body the 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 understanding that we are part bacteria virus fungi very much part of who we are and it actually <clears throat> without it we're 20,000 genes with it we're 2 million so much of our intelligence is in these things that we we spend our life trying to get rid of outside you know don't do that watch this watch that and so we we lose that connection and this became a real focus of mine because it was so unknown as well, this unknown intelligence, but needing to feed it, nurture it, it really fell with that journey of this love for the unknown. Um, and so I got into living f foods, fermenting um, sourdough starters so we could make sourdough bread at home, uh, kefir, yogurt, kombucha, and making things like kimchi, uh, all these kind of... Uh, amazing things at home and and it really stuck sort of made a difference to our lifestyle so we brought out a um a kombucha uh first drink we brought out was kombucha we have water kefir we have shots and we've got adaptogenic drinks now and they're all under the name of number one living which is the brand it's been out for a while but it's <coughs> it's one of those brilliant things and it was <coughs> excuse me inspired by this journey it was one of those things that just spins off you're suddenly going through this journey and then something comes out of you that says i really I want to do this. Why? Because I feel it's important. It's part of the meaning. I feel like it can make a difference. I feel like the world's moving in a direction with antibiotics finding their way into food chains that, you know, we're losing this kind of enormous intelligence and health and and, and what have you. So, yeah, that's, it is a big part of me. And, and how you eat as well, huge. When I was younger, you know, I had such a monotonous diet. My choice. I just wouldn't, I was so fussy. I wouldn't go out of my way. And then later on, I um, yeah. Now I look at it, and I, I I do eat a hell of a lot of uh, vegetables. I can't stop just sort of trying new ones, playing them out. And I don't know. It's difficult somehow to say, oh well, I feel so much better than I did when I was young. But I know for sure that I feel so much more connected, definitely. And it's it's a privileged opportunity I have to eat like that. So when I do eat, I I try and make sure I'm I'm sort of respectful and grateful for it. When I do. Honestly, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed talking to you today. I think it's 
that open-mindedness to things changing and life looking different and how deep you've got to do to do that I don't think can ever be underestimated and I just really appreciate the vulnerability and honesty with which you've shared that because I think it will mean a lot to people as I said what I'm really keen to show is that we all have these moments whether they're big or small whether there's lots of little catalysts or one big catalyst but moments where we perhaps know if we're completely honest with ourselves that something's not quite right but changing things doing things about it it's not easy and I think knowing that you're not alone ever in that journey that even people that we can look at and admire so deeply I mean there's so few moments in my life where I could tell you where I was when something happened and I've got to be honest and say I'm not really a sports fan (laughs) (laughs) save that to the end of the interview but I remember where I was when you got the goal like I remember it so clearly I was probably about 12 and it was at one of those huge moments and I, you know, it just, there, that's one of the reasons I was just so fascinated to talk to you is because I know that I was in a room of, I don't know, 800 people and you were just a god and yet you're sitting here saying, that's how everyone else saw me and I saw myself as empty and like I didn't have huge self-worth and I think to be able to recognise that and turn that around and now have this wisdom and the courage to share that wisdom with such openness and authenticity is just very very unusual and so i just really want to say a huge thank you for taking the time to share it my pleasure thank you thanks for having me on and and giving me a an opportunity to to talk i think just just before i finish this something really really important to me is that speaking about all these things you mentioned before people meeting their own unique challenges everyone's going through things so different i'm so so aware when i was younger i was so dogmatic i was so i've got the answer do this do this and i was telling people how to be how to act what to say whereas now i'm in a space where i realize more than anything that i haven't got anything for anyone else i've just got my experience and to be able to share your experience that's kind of it and i even steer away from saying i haven't helped anyone do anything i haven't given this to anyone i just kind of live in my life and exploring that um and so it's it's really important that i think that everything that gets said that there is that massive respect for people that are facing things that I can't even imagine. Uh, and it's so nice, as you mentioned, when you meet people on the street to look and go, wow, who knows what it's like to be you and what you're going through. But what I've found is that these things have some kind of truth and, and meaning for me and they have opened up into a space of, of, of freedom that I know I've always been after. Well, thank you. Honestly, it's been amazing. I so appreciate it. Pleasure.